As I was a child, there was no doubt that I was fascinated by what I heard on radio. I had a wonderful teacher. Teacher said, just because you're young doesn't mean you don't know what you want to do. I was 16 years old, and I had this mad crush on a boy who was an announcer at the local station in Alabama. And I thought, how will I ever get him to notice me? I thought, well, I'll just get on the air. Radio was the theater that we enjoyed. And I said, this, this is what I want to do and be in the arts. And I fell in love with the microphone instead of the boy. And I've been in the business ever since. and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat presents Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. My dear, is Maxwell House the best coffee in the whole world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. <laughs> Presenting the amazing interplanetary adventures of Flash Gordon. Last week, Flash Gordon was given a charge of electrical current which would keep him invisible for a time sufficient for him to make a trip to the Witch Queen's palace. But he was warned most emphatically by Dr. Zarkov. Well, in my mind, radio theater or radio drama is really anything that is performed for a, a sound-only medium that has an element of story in it. So the creative use of aural art, I think, is radio drama. So the reason we uh, decided to do the sound design class is, is one, we wanted to make sure we were doing a cross-platform within communication arts. So we're covering theater, radio, and television. This particular project is, is more of a radio drama. We decided to do the radio drama simply because it's not done that often. It's kind of uh, old school, if you will. The kids are so reliant on the digital media um, that they in terms of the creativity, or we're having problems in the beginning trying to come up with the sound effects and, and how to make these things low-tech. We're hoping that they'll get an appreciation for how hard this really is. You get into this comfort zone of like, ah, just go ahead and read through it, we'll fix everything. But when it's live, you know, it, it pushes us uh, whippersnappers out of our element. It seems to be uh, something that's done more as a an occasional thing, you know, a little excursion into something different. So I think it would be very, very hard to find people who were as professional in their radio technique today um, as uh, there were many actors and actresses in, in the 40s and 50s. It was the first dramatic show put on radio in, um, in Gadsden, Alabama. And it was a very uh, artistic type person who was just doing this thing. And I remember I had one line to a very attractive young man on the other side of the microphone. And I remember the line till this day. It was Hillary. Oh, Hillary, I love you. I remember the director said, okay, Rosemary, I want you to fade in slowly. Well, I guess I didn't know what fade in meant. I walked up to the mic and said the line right in the mic. That was not fading in, so they, I remember Richard Woodmark said, this is how you do it. You start the line three feet off talking. You don't walk up to the mic and then just say, I mean, you have to learn those things. You know, sometimes there were technical difficulties. There was always an organist standing by. You don't really ever see on television, please stand by, we're having technical difficulties. I'm not sure that many young people today know that we used to see that a lot on television and you used to hear it on radio a fair amount too because things didn't always go smoothly. 
I did something so terrible. In fact, it's written up in a book. My husband's name is supposed to be Phil. And I think they said, how is Phil doing with the farm? And I'm supposed to say, Phil is having trouble with his potato crop. And I said, oh, Phil is having trouble with his potato crop. And I got his hysterical laugh because I looked in the control room and everybody had disappeared. They were laughing so hard. And the organist was laughing so hard he was banging his head on the organ. Twenty years later, I'm sitting home one night, and it's one o'clock in the morning, and I'm watching Johnny Carson. And Johnny Carson said, well, we are going to do a uh, replay of a terrible fluff made on the radio by Rosemary Rice years ago, and they had hired actors to, to and they did this on the Johnny Carson show. All I could think of was, why are they not hiring me to play myself? They hired somebody else to, to this was that bad a fluff. For two or three generations of Americans, if you met your friends at work or at school and talked about the television or the radio that you enjoyed the previous night, most everybody saw the same things. Did you see Jack Benny last night? Did you see that great show, da 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 last night? Did you hear that, this and that? And maybe a third of the people, maybe half of the people you knew would have seen the same thing, and you had a common experience to discuss. Well, it's, it's hard for me to imagine how people created drama in such a, a well-timed and convincing manner at all. We made it sound like it was happening. And we would, uh, someone would follow somebody in and slam the door behind, or they would open the door and it would make a noise when they opened it. We did a lot of that sort of thing. I remember standing in my New York apartment, five flight walk up when you had to walk all the way, in front of a mirror thinking, what does it sound like? A baby. And I thought, it sounds like a, a cat. And it went like this. Meow. Meow, meow, and I got it that way. So you had to be creative. Next morning, time for the character to cry like a baby. There I was on my little sideways and my crying like a baby. So we had to do that. We had to be creative. Sound effects is one of those elements that I think radio dramatists and creators learned early on you know, a little bit goes a long way. Too much, in effect, ruins realism. Now, in New York, this is the way it worked. You'd go in and you hadn't seen the script. You had a table reading, all the actors and the director, the assistant director. Didn't use yellow markers like you do nowadays. You took a pencil and you circled them and made all the notes. You had one table reading, you have about a 10 minute break, and everybody smoked, so there was this, this, this fog <laughs> over the entire thing. And then you come back in, have the second table reading, then you get up on mic, have your dress rehearsal, a five minute break, and then you were on, coast to coast. Back in the day, I imagine that they didn't mix the sound for the studio audience, they were mixing the sound for the radio audience, the people that were out there in radio land. And I was working live with a 40-piece orchestra, and I had all the dialogue, and I can remember getting in the studio and the take one, and we started. You make one fluff, one little glitch, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. You can't edit it in. Therefore, sometimes you'd have, you'd just get to the end after 15 minutes, you make one little little boo-boo, and you'd have to go way back and do the whole thing over. With recording, of course, it all changes, because then you can do a little bit of cutting and pasting and rearranging uh, in, in uh, post-production, but that was not possible in the early days of radio drama. You can use this modern technology, but it's not just something that happens when you turn it on. It's something that happens when you know what you're doing. Extensive research has proved conclusively that there are two kinds of husbands. One, the husband who takes absolutely no interest whatsoever in household affairs. And two, the husband whose wife wishes he'd mind his own business and leave things alone. It's tough to remember that as this character, you have to like be able to hit 
a button to make a telephone ring, even though it has nothing to do with what you're talking about. Some of the sound effects that we found was an actual old telephone, and we picked it up and, you know, dialed it and stuff like that. And, and I used uh, my keyboard and a little amp, so none of that is post-edit. Mm -hmm. For the Maxwell's coffee, we had a kind of a coffee gurgling noise in the background. Yeah. Percolator is what it was called. We had one of those. It was a, a straw, basically, and a cup of water. Then I went into the scene shop, found a whole bunch of just scrap wood and an old door hinge that would snap shut. Mm -hmm. I rigged it together so that so when it opens, it was like a big clapper. It would just, you let go of it and it just slam back in and make the creaky sound. My dad gave me a box of uh, five, no, six glass vases. We went and shouted them out back and then put them in a bag and just kind of dropped that on the table and it sounded like the window being shattered. Certain things work over the microphone live that you wouldn't expect them to. You know, just walking around might not work for footsteps, but, you know, like clapping pieces of wood on other pieces of wood might sound great and you don't know until you go back and review it. In 1948, television came in and started trying to take over. And so when radio went out to sell itself, we had to sell on the idea that we could do more with imagination than, than anybody could, than television could ever do it. I know there was one show on radio called One Man's Family that went on for years and years and years, and all the people kind of grew old with it. They knew they had a job for life. We started out as a child and ended up as the grandmother. It was a real cheap form of entertainment. Granted, it was fairly cheap to go to a film, but if you were out there in rural America and you're out on a farm somewhere, you're probably not going to get to go to too many uh, entertainment programs. And so different people would speak to us at National Association of Broadcaster Meeting, Georgia Association of Broadcaster Meeting, and they would illustrate how you could use sounds. And one of the favorite ones was a man who devised a bunch of B-36 bombers flying over the ocean and dropping uh, maraschino cherries into whipped cream. And he had a sound effect that sounded like B-36 bombers open the bomb bay doors, now release the maraschino cherries, and they would go down and pop, you know, and hit the whipped cream and everything. And when he got through, he said, let me see you do that on a 21-inch screen, you know. Actors were really desperately wanting for radio to stay, you know, and we all had our heads buried in the sand. I remember this wonderful announcer. He got so terrified that everything went out of his head. He blew his lines. He finally got out of the business, so he could not handle the transition. Some made it, and some didn't. To begin with, you've got three cameras, normally, instead of one microphone. Frequently, the crawl would not do, and they would jam, so you wouldn't have your lines. So you're working with cards. And one time, I had worked Howdy four days, and then I had one day off, and they said, Edith, oh, we've got Bob Hope in the huge studio next door at the live one. has got to have a cue card, girl. Are you available? I said, sure. So I did all the things. There were 20 cards. They're pretty heavy. And I walked next door to the studio across at 30 Rockefeller Plaza. It would seat thousands of people. It was where Milton Burrow used to do his show. And Bob Hope was in town, and it had this uh, maybe 3,000 people there, and you had the, the proscenium stage, and then you had a thing that came out where the camera could go. They put me on a double step ladder to get me up to it, and had a stage hand hold the back of my legs, and another stage hand to hold the back of his, and I perilously holding up there these cars, very heavy. And they said, Mr. Hope does not do rehearsals. He just comes on, he reads his monologue, from you. There were about 20 seconds before airtime. Bob Hope walked out, looked at me in the cards, and he said, if you drop those, honey, we're dead. That's the hardest thing I have ever done in show business. I thought I'd die right then. There's never been a show that I have ever done that so threw me as that I didn't, and I still lived, but it took me weeks to recover from that. When the golden age of radio came to an end in the early 50s or t during the 50s at some point with the advent of television. Essentially all the money and the creativity and the top talent moved from radio into television 
as that came along. In the United States, people thought radio theater was a dying art and then a dead art. You do have to lay this at the doorstep of the advertising-driven system because when television came in, that was the hot new medium, the hot new technology, and the networks, of course, that had been the radio networks became the television networks and were very anxious to transfer their big stars, their big advertisers, their big shows to the new medium to help pay for it. And in fact, for many years, they actually took the profits from radio and helped to build up television. It took away our visualization and visualized it for us. I mean, that was the nail in the coffin for radio. It, they just eventually, by the 60s, had lost their audience. Yes, I can do a radio show that beats that in the sound of it, and I can, I can produce it a lot cheaper than they produce one of those big television shows. But I'm not sure that I can pull you back from watching the medium on television or uh, Law and Order on television and tell you that I'm going to do a good show about a district attorney. I, I just don't believe your habit is there that you're going to run back to radio. Radio plays are <laughs> not, not here, but when I think of the radio, I think of music. I yeah, mean, with, yeah. I, I, I listen to the radio all the time. It's Do all I music. think radio plays are dead? I, I'd say that it's... Not unless you listen to NPR. I mean, the, yeah. It's, it's car pretty, talk. And then it's getting pretty close. Yeah. I think that that kind of stuff is something that it could potentially be a, a medium that could be brought back. It's kind of like the newspaper. Of course, everybody's saying radio's gonna die. Oh, I'm not really sure radio's gonna die because I've been to its funeral four or five times. I think that, um, I think people now who are not familiar with it find it fascinating. You know, they've never heard anything like these radio programs before, and it's, it's a wonderful art form. Norman Corwin has told me that everyone thought of their work as ephemeral in those days. It was just the way they regarded it. We build up, we do all this work, we get ready to do the performance, we put the performance out there, and then it's over with, it's done with, it's gone forever, we forget it and we move on to the next thing. Well, one, when you're very young, you don't usually think that much. You just do it. You have to that when you're young. You have to think you own the world. You have to think you can do anything. They never realized that two generations later, the recording of that performance would be out there, would be available to people, would be still enjoyable and enjoyed. Now, of course, we grow up with this. This is normal today. But it was brand new, so new they didn't even realize it was happening. Encouraging the teaching of radio in high schools, colleges, universities, I think that's immensely important in drawing attention to the medium. But it seems to me that since you, for instance, in your age bracket, are looking at radio and what it did, to be able to include it with this incredible technology nowadays, it just makes the pie bigger and more interesting, so it's not really lost. It's just incorporated, sort of like a historical perspective, but that and people are doing it. There's an awful lot of, of possibility if you've got creative minds to do it. And whether or not we're turning out creative young people or not, I can't imagine that our journalism schools are packed with kids who say, I want to be in radio. I got to be in radio. I really like the voice for one. Like, you know, there's there's lots of different voices, but the voice that hello, welcome to the radio program. I I've, I've been doing that to to make fun of things and just to tell jokes for my whole life. And now I finally got to use that voice in something that it was applicable. Do you ever say to yourself, oh boy, I feel lazy today. Don't let it worry you if you do, because you've got lots of company. No one denies that work is man's greatest need and almost his best friend. But that doesn't mean unnecessary work. It's important uh, to keep it alive. One, for culture, and two, because I guarantee you that within the next 10 years, there's going to be something that throws back to old-time radio, and you'll, you'll find some director needs an expert on the subject, and somebody way out in the desert is going to be like, hey, I'm really good at that. Uh, it's important to keep all those forms of art alive, because that's just what it is. It's, it's an art form like painting or anything else. Uh, it's an interesting, an interesting subject that I, I'm going to 
look more into, but yeah, they must have been crazy. It would be as important that you will possibly not agree with this. It would be as important as uh, fine paintings of opera. It is a medium that worked. It was good then. It can be good now as a part of the pie. It is that valuable. And it represented a great part of the, the early 20th century, about the first 50 years into it. I don't think that the acting is much affected by all this new technological stuff. It's still acting as acting. Actors want to connect with whoever they're talking to, so that's not a problem, it's just a given. But it, it's fascinating. I guess I get my contact with people who worked in radio through archival collections and the mementos and the papers and the recordings that they leave behind. It's a very touching experience. You feel sometimes that you really are getting to know someone who did wonderful things and now here's the record that remains. I have actually spent something like 63 years getting up every day, going to a radio station, performing before an awful lot of people that I never knew, never saw, never met. So here was this little box with a battery and a speaker in it, and I could pick up some big city somewhere. You know, Jack Benny was talking to me. You have the new media coming along, and every time a new medium comes along, it changes the position of the old media. And that's what's happening here, too. But also, the technology of creating and producing. I don't know whether I'm excited or alarmed that actors could be totally replaced by mechanical objects. Uh, that I find alarming. It won't make that much difference to me. I've had over 50 years in the business, but for all of you coming along, I hope that the human element in the technology will still be part of the big pie. If I had it to do over again, I'd do it exactly the way I did it. But if I could bring it back, I certainly would. And so, preserving radio and the recordings of radio in the first part of the 20th century is not only essential, it's a heck of a lot of fun. But what has been fascinating to me is I've just finished doing that small character part in The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and I didn't know until I arrived on set that it's a hundred and sixty seven million dollar digital movie which means that I've gone from wire recorders to television to color television to the first digital kickoff of Paramount Warner Brothers and that whole scope just blows my mind. Coffee that's always good to the last drop.